welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today we have another episode as part of our Listen and Learn series. This one will be discussing relevance. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We are here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Hi, and welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast, Listen and Learn series. Today, we are going to be talking about an important topic for any evidence class, relevance. Now, on a gut level, most people already have an idea of what relevance means, right? If someone says, that's not relevant, we know that they meant it's outside the scope of what matters. In a courtroom situation, relevance is an important first step hurdle to get over when introducing any kind of evidence, whether that be a document, witness testimony, or a piece of physical evidence. Relevance is a pretty low bar, meaning that evidence may be deemed relevant if it meets some pretty easy criteria. Keep in mind, though, relevance is not the same as admissibility. Just because evidence passes the relevance test does not mean that it will actually get into court. It could be thrown out by a judge for some other reason later on in the analysis. In law school, most classes cover the federal rules of evidence, so that's what we will be focusing on today. Now, your class may incorporate state law as well, so there can be some distinctions, And always make sure you know what law you're responsible for on your final exam. Well, let's jump in, shall we? There are two basic kinds of relevance, logical relevance and legal relevance. Each one has a different federal rule. Evidence is logically relevant if it tends to make a fact of consequence more or less likely than it would be without the evidence. So what does that mean? Well, a fact of consequence is a fact that the law deems important. So basically, the evidence is relevant if it says something about an important fact in the case. The evidence can make a key fact look more likely to be true, like the same murder weapon makes it likely our guy was the killer. Or evidence can make an important fact less likely to be true. For example, he was on vacation at the time, which means he was probably not at the crime scene. Now, on the other hand, we've got legal relevance. Evidence is legally relevant if its probative value is not substantially outweighed by some kind of danger. The most commonly tested danger is a risk of prejudice. Legal relevance is about balancing. Under FRE 403, there is a test that weighs what is called the probative value of the evidence against the risk of admitting the evidence into court. The risk could be for things like prejudicing a party, wasting time, or misleading the jury. The question for the judge here is basically, how useful is this piece of evidence versus how problematic is it going to be? To simplify, if the evidence is more helpful than hurtful, it will be admitted. These concepts are pretty straightforward, but they can get more confusing when applied. So let's just jump into a hypo and try them out. This question is from a July 2009 bar exam in California. We've taken just one small piece of the fact pattern at a time to limit the discussion to relevance. Here we go. While driving their cars, Paula and Dan collided and each suffered personal injuries and property damage. Paula sued Dan for negligence and Dan filed a cross complaint for negligence against Paula. At the ensuing jury trial, Paula testified that she was driving to meet her husband, Hank, and that Dan drove his car into hers. Dan testified that as he and Paula were waiting for the ambulance immediately following the accident, Wilma handed him a note. Wilma had been identified as a witness during discovery, but had died before she could be deposed. The court granted a motion by Dan to admit the note into evidence. The note says, I saw the whole thing. Paula was speeding. She was definitely negligent. Is Wilma's note relevant? Well, let's go through logical relevance first. I think the easiest way to do this is to ask, one, what is the fact of consequence that we're talking about? And then two, does the piece of evidence make that fact more or less likely to be true? So what's the fact? In other words, what's the question the court is trying to answer in this case? Well, Paula sued Dan for negligence. So the main question is whether Dan was negligent. 
you shouldn't get into a full-blown negligence analysis from torts. It's sufficient just to have a general idea of what negligence means. In other words, was Dan not acting carefully enough? That's our fact of consequence we're getting at here. Facts about Dan being careful. So now let's look at the evidence. Here we are talking about Wilma's note. To figure out relevance, we should go back to the fact pattern and see exactly what the note said. Wilma said she saw the accident and Paula was speeding and she stated that Paula was negligent. For the final step of logical relevance, we look at whether the note makes the negligence of Dan more or less likely to be true. So if Paula was speeding, that makes it less likely that Dan caused the accident, right? It makes it look like Paula herself caused the accident. Because the evidence in question makes the fact of consequence less likely to be true, the evidence is logically relevant. Make sense? Now let's move on to legal relevance. For this part, remember that we are doing a balancing test. I think the easiest way to accomplish this is to take the prejudicial or bad effect on one side and the probative value or good effect on the other side, then see which outweighs. Here, the prejudice of the note is that it makes Paula look like a negligent driver. Now that hurts Paula. Remember though, the standard is unfair prejudice. Is it unfair to call Paula negligent or say she was speeding? Well, not really, that's what the whole case is about. Next, look at the probative value. The note, if true, solves the case, right? If Paula was negligent, that probably means she's the person who caused the accident or at least contributed to causing it. That means that the probative value is very high. So on the one hand, we have the note making Paula look like a less than careful driver, which she's not gonna be happy about. But on the other hand, we have some very valuable information. The probative value will outweigh and the note will be deemed legally relevant. Remember, this does not mean that it will necessarily be admissible in court. This is just the very first hurdle. The note may get thrown out for some other reason later in the analysis, but that is a separate issue and analysis. Let's try another hypo. This is from the same bar question as before. In his case in chief, Dan called a paramedic who had treated Paula at the scene of the accident. Dan showed the paramedic a greeting card and the paramedic testified that he had found the card in Paula's pocket as he was treating her. The court granted a motion by Dan to admit the card into evidence. The card states, Dearest Paula, hurry home from work as fast as you can today. We need to get an early start on our weekend trip to the mountains. Love, Hank. Is Hank's note relevant? So let's go through the steps. Logical relevance first. What's our fact of consequence? Same thing as before. So who caused the accident? Was it Dan, the one who was negligent, or was it Paula? Okay, what's our evidence here? The note from Hank, who we know from before is Paula's husband. He said, hurry home so we can start our vacation. Well, that sounds pretty irrelevant at first, right? Who cares if he wants to go on vacation? What does that have to do with anything? But let's look at the whole situation. This is a car crash, and there are allegations that Paula was speeding. The evidence is about telling Paula to hurry. Could that card saying to hurry up make it more likely that Paula would drive home super quickly? Yes, the card is logically relevant. Remember, this is a super low bar. Now the next step is legal relevance. What's our prejudicial effect? Again, the note makes it look like Paula was speeding, which is not a good look for Paula. Is that unfair prejudice? No. What's the probative value? Same, super high. If Paula was speeding, that helps solve the case. So the card is also legally relevant. Starting to get the hang of it? Let's try some more examples from this same hypo. Paula also testified that as she and Dan were waiting for an ambulance immediately following the accident, Dan said, I have plenty of insurance to cover your injuries. Is Dan's statement relevant? Well, first, logical relevance. What is the fact of consequence? Who caused the accident, right? What is the evidence in question? Dan saying his insurance will cover Paula. Does saying this make it more likely that it was Dan's fault? Well, maybe Dan is just trying to be nice. Or maybe he knows he caused the accident and feels bad. But how does insurance work? Is Dan's insurance going to cover Paula if Dan did not cause the accident? No way. That means that the insurance statement makes it more likely that Dan was at fault. He knew he caused the accident. So he knew they'd be using his insurance. Do we know Dan's thought process for sure? No, but again, this is a low bar. Logical relevance is met. Now next, legal relevance. 
What's our prejudicial effect? Well, regardless of the reason that Dan offered to have his insurance cover Paula, this statement does make him look like he caused the accident. So is this prejudice unfair? No. What's the probative value? Well, if Dan caused the accident, that solves the whole case. So the probative value is really high. The probative value outweighs, so legal relevance is met. Here's our last fact pattern. This one is from a July 2005 California bar exam on evidence. We'll take a bigger chunk of facts this time to make this look more like something you might see on a real exam. Dan was charged with arson. The prosecution attempted to prove that he burned down his failing business to get the insurance proceeds. It is uncontested that the fire was started with gasoline. At a jury trial, the following occurred. The prosecution called neighbor who testified that 15 minutes after the fire broke out, he saw a blue Corvette speed from the scene. The prosecution next called Detective Pry. Pry testified that he checked motor vehicle department records and found that a blue Corvette was registered to Dan. Pry also testified that he observed a blue Corvette in the driveway of Dan's house. The prosecution then called Scribe, the bookkeeper for Dan's business. Scribe testified that two months before the fire, Dan told Scribe to record some phony accounts receivable to increase his chances of obtaining a loan from a bank. Scribe then testified that she created and recorded an account receivable from a fictitious entity in the amount of $250,000, but that bank denied the loan anyway. Scribe further testified that two days after the fire, Dan again told her to create some phony accounts receivable, but that she refused to do so. Are Pry and Scribe's testimony relevant? Okay, let's jump in. Whenever you see an exam question that asks about two separate pieces of evidence, like two witnesses' testimony here, you should break them up and discuss each one in turn. So let's look at Pry first. We'll notice that Pry's testimony actually said a couple of different things, right? He said that the DMV records showed a blue Corvette registered to Dan. He also said he saw a blue Corvette parked at Dan's house. We should consider both of these. On evidence exams, always consider breaking up statements into parts if needed. Sometimes one statement will be relevant and the other won't be. Going back to our attack plan, logical relevance is always first. So our first question is, what is the fact of consequence? Here, the fact of consequence is whether Dan started the fire. Question two, what is the evidence we're dealing with? The things Pry said about the blue Corvette. So let's match them up. Does Dan having a blue Corvette registered to him make it more likely that he started the fire? Well, the neighbor said that 15 minutes after the fire broke out, he saw a blue Corvette speeding away from the scene. Was that Dan? Well, we don't know. It could have been someone else driving the same kind of car. We don't have a plate number and nobody actually saw Dan in the car. But remember, relevance is not an exact science and it's not a high bar. We don't need to know that it was Dan for sure. We just need to know if it was more likely to be Dan. A blue Corvette leaving the fire scene and Dan owning a blue Corvette are enough of a match for relevance. If Dan had a blue Corvette, that makes it more likely it was him speeding away, which means it's more likely he started the fire. Now, what about Pry seeing the car parked in Dan's driveway? Does that make it more likely that it was Dan on the scene of the fire? Well, yes, because it shows that Dan still had the car and it makes it more likely that it was him driving the car on the day of the fire. Logical relevance is met. Now let's move on to legal relevance. First question, what is the potential prejudice of the piece of evidence that we're looking at? Well, Dan having the same car as the getaway car does make Dan look guilty. That's prejudicial to him. On the other hand, when we take the next step and look at the probative value, we see that if Dan was fleeing the scene, well, that pretty much solves the case of who the arsonist is. That means that the probative value is super high. The probative values will outweigh. Legal relevance is met. Seeing any patterns here? On exams, it's pretty likely that the evidence will be relevant. Again, it's a low threshold. So let's look at our second witness, Scribe. Logical relevance first. What's our fact of consequence? Same, whether Dan started the fire. Now let's see what the piece of evidence in question was. This involves going back to the fact pattern and finding anything Scribe said. Gather up every statement she made. On on an exam, you may find it helpful to highlight different people's statements, or maybe just their names in different colors so you can find them more easily. So who is Scribe? She's the bookkeeper for Dan's business. And what did she say? She said Dan wanted her to basically lie to get money from a bank, and she tried, but the bank said no. 
Does this make it more likely that Dan burned the building down? Well, let's go to the facts again and remember that the building in question is Dan's own failed business and that he was charged with arson for trying to get insurance money after the fire. Does Dan telling his bookkeeper to lie and to try and get a bank loan and that loan then getting denied make it more likely that Dan burned down his own building to get the insurance money? Well, sure. Dan needed money. He was desperate enough to lie. The lie failed and all of this gives him motive to start the fire. Again, here, do we know for sure that it was Dan? No, but relevance is not an exact science. The fact that the evidence makes it even a bit more likely to be Dan means that we have enough to check off logical relevance. Next up, we have legal relevance. First question, what's our potential prejudice? Well, this testimony about lying to get money from the bank makes Dan look like a pretty bad guy, right? If true, he's pretty dishonest and trying to get Scribe to be dishonest as well. That's definitely prejudicial to him. The jury would see that and think that Dan was a horrible person. On the other hand, though, second question, what's the probative value? Well, this story is about Dan telling Scribe to lie to the banks and then getting denied, and that shows a great motive for Dan to burn down the building and try to get some money out of the insurance company. The probative value of Scribe's testimony is very high and would outweigh the prejudice of making Dan sound like a fraud. Once again, legal relevance is met. Okay, well, that wraps up the hypo part of our discussion. Before we conclude, let's talk about exam taking. In your evidence class, your professor may want you to look at logical and legal relevance separately, or she may want you to combine the discussion. You may be using the federal rules alone or possibly comparing and contrasting to state rules in your jurisdiction. All of this is important to figure out well before the exam so you can make sure that you're practicing in the right way. Something we often see law students doing with relevance that will cause you to lose points on an exam is not being specific enough. A good way to check is to go back and read your hypo answer and ask yourself if you could have written it without knowing what the facts were. For example, if you said something like, prize testimony is legally relevant because the probative value substantially outweighs the risk of any prejudice to Dan, that's a problem. Why? Because it doesn't tell your professor who is grading your exam anything more than the party names. And the rest of that statement is basically just reiterating the rule. So there's no analysis. And analysis is where most of the points are. Reading a statement like that, I as your professor would have no idea why you thought the statement was relevant, why you thought the probative value was, what you thought the prejudice was, or why you concluded the way you did. Believe it or not, we see this all the time. It just goes to show that sometimes you might have the right idea in your head, but then you write something down that is so conclusory that it doesn't show your thought process at all. The important takeaway here is don't do this on an exam. Just like we did in our examples today, get precise with what the evidence in question is, what the fact of consequence is, what the probative value and prejudicial effect are, and explain how you're matching the facts to those rule elements. As we always say, you should use because when you write because it will force you to explain and that explanation is what your professor is looking for. And with that, we are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a moment to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Feel free to stop by our website at lawschooltoolbox.com to get more podcasts and our tried and true exam taking tips. If you're studying for the bar exam, you may want to check out our bar exam toolbox podcast and website as well. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee, that's me and Allison at Lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or Allison at lawschooltoolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Thank you.